Hello and welcome to the special bonus episode of The Dairy Edge. Chagas are running a weekly Let's Talk Dairy webinar series, which is also being made available as a podcast. On this week's webinar, George Ramsbottom joins Stuart Childs to discuss milk replacer spec for calf feeding. So today I'm joined by my colleague George Ramsbottom and George is going to cover a, a bit of an update in relation to milk uh, replacer specification and so forth. Uh, so obviously, I suppose with the rising costs in general, I suppose when milk price goes up, milk replacer price tends to go up as well. Um, and there may be people asking questions in their own minds whether they'll go back to feeding whole milk maybe or continue with the milk replacer that they might be on. So I suppose George is going to cover the details of getting a, a good milk replacer, uh, an appropriate milk replacer for rearing the stock that you're rearing. And we maybe we'll look at as well the valuing the product as well. So um at the end of it we can take questions in terms of what people are thinking about uh switching product whether you're talking about switching back to to whole milk or staying on the milk replacer i suppose from my own perspective george i'd be of the opinion that if you've been on a particular regime with the last uh, number of years i wouldn't go jumping around and chopping and changing just because of milk price anyway no, no. your your slides will probably give us more detail or will give us more detail in relation to the actual cost of using milk replacer so I'll let you share away there and encourage people to put in the questions as we go along, obviously, and we'll deal with them uh, as we go. Thanks. No problem at all, Stuart. Okay, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm just going to talk to you for a few minutes about um, okay, some of our, our ideas, our latest kind of um, uh, guidelines in terms of micro places and where we are with, with all that kind of thing. So, look, there are four kind of non-negotiables um, that have been agreed by the technical working group in Animal Health Ireland, of which I'm not a member, I might add, on calf care. And, and they relate to a milk replacer for younger younger calves in particular. Uh, the four non-negotiables are protein content in a milk replacer, a quality milk replacer, needs to be between around 23 to 26% are the kind of guideline figures that they use for that. In terms of fat content, if that's where the energy is coming from, it, that'll need to be somewhere between 16 and 20 percent of the kind of the, the guideline figures for fat content of a quality milk replacer. In terms of ash content, some, somewhere between seven and nine percent is the kind of the figure they talk about, as well as, as close to seven as you can get it. And in terms of fiber content, less than 0.1 percent. If we just look back at the fat content, we're not too fussy about where the fat comes from, whether it's coming from an animal derived source or a plant derived source. Performance of the calf is, is equally good on those. In terms of the, the protein content of 23 to 26%, we're a bit more fussy here. And we, we really like, particularly for young calves, that those proteins should be from milk-derived source as much as possible. And the reason for that is because you could have a high protein content in your, in your um, milk replacer, but if the amino acid profile of them isn't right, you need lots of, I think, lysine and methionine are two key ones there in the, young, in the growing calf. If a lot of them are coming from plant-derived sources, they mightn't have that kind of a quality amino acid profile to ensure good growth in your calf. George, that's an important point in terms of price as well, because obviously the vegetable proteins are probably cheaper. As, as oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. And how we, but how we know, Stuart, is if there's a, if there's a high fiber content, if the fiber content in the in the milk replacer that you're buying is is high, so if it's over 0.1%, there's a good there's a good chance that some of the the, the protein sources in it are being plant derived. So we, we were aiming, our, our recommendation, or the AHI technical working group recommendation is that fiber content should be very low, less than 0.1%. And if it is in general, you're, you're getting a high, a high quality milk replacer, that's milk protein derived. They're, they're the kind that's of four specs we talk about. Whey or skim basically is what you Generally whey, skim milk powder or preferably whey milk powder. One or, or the other will, will, will do that for you. And if you think about the whey, the whey powders, they're very expensive per, per um, they're very expensive per ton at the moment because you're competing with bodybuilders to, to buy them, basically, what we're saying, yeah. I think at the moment, someone told me they're about 14, well, I think it's either 14,000 dollars or 14,000 euros relative to the, to the skim milk powders. They're about 4,000, uh, I, I presume it's they're traded in dollars, 4,000 yeah. a ton, okay? Yeah. So, um, look, we're looking for a kind of a quality milk replacer and that's the kind of spec that's been set uh, for those uh, type of products. Now we can, we'll talk about price in a minute, we'll come back to that, okay? Uh, one of the earlier at it actually, and I thought it was going to come out. In terms of the cost of, of milk replacement, how, how do we calculate? You were referring earlier on there, Stuart, to people maybe going back to whole milk um, to, uh, because of the price of the powder. So the powders have jumped at least a 10 or a ton, and someone told me they've gone up again in the last couple of days. 
<clears throat> I had look around there and we can see powders on the market for 45 euro a ton. Big of hard, 45 euro a bag. We can see them for between 55 and 60 euro a bag. Look at the spec, buy on the spec. If the spec is right and they're relatively good value, you go for them. Just taking a price, so we'll, we'll use a ballpark there of 58 euro, which is midway between some of the powders I'm looking at that are available at the moment. Typically, your bag of powder we're talking about is a 20 kilo bag for, for that kind of money, whether it's 55, 56, 58, whatever the price is. If we assume a mixing rate, which is a kind of a fairly common mixing rate used for twice a day powders of 125 grams per litre, a 20 kilo bag of the powder would make 160 litres of milk replacer solution. And at a cost of 58 euro for the 160, for the powder for 160 litres of made up, that's the equivalent of 36 and a, half and a quarter cent per litre before water heating costs and mixing costs are, are accounted for. So you're talking a ballpark around somewhere between 35 and up to 40 cent per litre for the, for the powders that you're going to be um, using to, uh, as a micro, in a microplacer format before heating and mixing costs. So that's the kind of price of where there were a good bit less last year, Stuart. It was working out at around a tenner a bag last year, but look at the way things are at the moment. This is the cost we're talking around. Around 36 cent per litre is what we're talking about. So it's up about 20 percent, I think. Um... It's actually up about 20%, exactly. There's a supplement in the journal today, you know, as well. Um, and it does it actually has a, a good share of the products. Now, not all products are, are listed in it, and it's going to give you the price per ton for each of those as well. So people will be able to see. I off the top of my head, I think we're talking about around the two thousand a ton last year, and it's up closer to two and a half thousand a ton for a lot of those, or two and a half, yeah, two and a half thousand a ton for yeah. a lot of those products now. But um, I suppose the, the key thing there, George, before you move on, like is uh, I know Kerry sent out um, forward milk price uh, text there yesterday to their suppliers and saw it on, on, um, online as well last night. We'll say that they're, they're talking about maybe 43 or 44 cent, I think, on the forward uh, price, or 42 cent, sorry, I think, 42 right. cent. As a half. base price, sure. Yeah. So, like, <laughs> it's it's quite on a pair, and like, they probably work in tandem, really. So, when milk price is good, your milk replacer price is obviously going to increase if you're if you're going down the dairy um, product type product. Like if you're using the vegetable pro proteins, it's probably going to stay a little bit cheaper. But then, as you said, it's not the ideal uh, scenario. Well, not for but, young calves. I wouldn't recommend them. Sure, it's as simple yeah, as that. Yeah. I think so, what will determine it more than anything else is convenience. What suits the operation that you're on? If yeah. the setup is 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 uh, in such such that you can feed. Um, that you can make up a whole a micro placer easily, but then I'd probably go down the micro placer route. In terms of performance, it'll be relatively similar. Yes. But if your setup, if your setup is is not suited to, to rearing cows on the placer, and really you have a, a system in place that'll feed cows milk to the calves, well, look at it, no problem feeding that either. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. It's not price is not going to drive it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. One over the other, put it that way. One versus the other, um, micro placers uh, will have a slightly lower energy content than whole milk. Typically, the reason for that is because our typical micro placer will have a, an oil or fat content, which is where the energy is, of between 16 and 20 percent. In terms of whole milk, it'll have more typically have a micro, have a, an energy, a fat content of around 25 percent. And the fat content is what's driving the energy content of the milk. So, so typically, it'll have a slightly lower energy content than whole milk. This huge variation between products, as we're already alluding to, mm -hmm. just be very careful of the spec of the product. If you're getting something that's, you can get products at the moment that are costing around forty-five euro a bag. Just have a look at the bag of powder and make sure it meets the criteria we set, particularly for the very young calf. We've seen it before. We're saying it again. Non-milk proteins are not suitable for very young calves. You really need for a whey or skim in, in the ingredient list for those sort of calves, and plenty of it. And in terms of protein requirements, if we're, if we're pushing for a higher growth rate. You probably need uh, some of the the upper end of the protein content in those, and that will drive uh, bone and uh, meat growth rather than than put a layer of fat on them. Oftentimes, anecdotally, what you hear is you hear farmers talking about the calves that are going to sell will go on whole milk, and they look roundier and fatter, but the performance on the milk replacer will be similar in terms of live weight gain. It'll be a different form of growth. It'll be less fatty growth. It'll be more bone and and uh, flesh growth that you're seeing in those calves. No, no, no real difference in performance if, performance if the replacer is is of a reasonably high quality meets the spec we talked about. How much does a calf need? Well, traditionally, when I was growing up as a child, about four litres a day, is what, about a gallon a day is what we fed to the calves, four and a half litres. <clears throat> the new thinking is 
that really we're talking about uh, looking for greater growth from our calves and, and feeding around six litres of a 12 and a half percent or 125 gram powder per litre mix is what we're talking about. That's a total of around 750 grams per calf per day. And the reason for that, Stuart, if you look at the, what the 750 grams of powder can support, well, it'll support two things. The first is it'll support maintenance of the calf to keep it ticking over, but it'll also support growth of the calf. So with 750 grams of powder going in, and we're assuming a 15 degrees Celsius calf out here for the young calf. In, in that scenario, the maintenance requirement for the calf is the equivalent of around 380 grams of the powder that you feed. So what you feed on top of that will promote growth. And typically we're talking about growth rates, surpluses then of around 370 grams. And as a rough rule of thumb, if you divide the 370 grams in two, that's, that's the kind of growth rate we're talking about in kilos of gain. So about 185 grams of gain will be achieved with 750 grams of milk powder going in uh, to a calf in a house that's at a temperature of 15 degrees Celsius. So temperature is also interplaying in terms of the kind of growth we can expect from our calves when they're being milk fed. If we look then, I'll, we'll just stick to the, the, the table in, in red there first, short in this one here. If you look at calf age, the lower critical temperature. So as the temperature goes down, more and more of the feed that a calf gets is being pushed towards uh, maintaining the calf and keeping it warm. So if we talk about a newborn calf, the lower critical temperature for a newborn calf is around 15 degrees Celsius, which sounds quite high. It's, it's higher than I would have thought. And typically we're looking at temperatures in calf, I was in calf houses yesterday and a couple of farms short, and the temperature in them was around seven degrees. Yeah. That's saying to me with the newborn calves, <clears throat> in fairness, yesterday was a cool enough day, but if we look at newborn calves, um, they're, they're using more than the 380 grams of powder to maintain themselves. So you're going to get slower growth in those calves if they've been kept in a cold house. But very quickly, um, even the newborn calf becomes more temperature tolerant. And by three weeks of age, the lower critical temperature or the temperature which it needs to burn more energy to maintain itself goes down rapidly. And I suppose the reason for that is a couple, there's a couple of things going on there. One is it's growing bigger. So bigger animals are more resilient to lower temperatures because of a smaller surface area relative to their body weight. And the second thing that's going on there is, um, yeah, they're, they're starting to develop a kind of a proto-rumen. So once we can encourage them to eat meal fairly quickly as a, a young calf and start to develop the rumen, rumen is like a hot water bottle. So it's, it's like having a hot water bottle strapped to your tummy and walking around. You'd be a lot warmer with that on you than you would uh, when you're uh, effectively a monogastric, which is what the newborn calf was. So what people will do where houses are cold with calves is they, probably the simplest thing to do. Well, the first thing you should do, and Akira alluded to it the other night, Kira Hayes alluded to it the other night, Stuart, on the webinar that we ran. But one of the first things you'll do is have a temp have the thermometer in the house so you can see what the actual temperature is. That can give you a good indicator of whether it's warm or cold. And that's the a, ma that's a max mean, <coughs> sorry, George, that's a max mean temperature, temp thermometer, yeah, as opposed yeah. to your kind of standard th thermometer. Like. Exactly. The, the second thing, Stuart, um, is you, you can... Uh, give them a real good bed of straw. A, a real good bed of straw, it'll be up around what we call a nesting score. Is it a nesting score is tree short, where basically the legs are hidden in the straw. And that's like a little, a little blanket under them, a kind of a duvet around them. And that'll make them more resilient to lower temperatures and they won't be burning up extra feed to maintain themselves. And in some cases, the third thing you can do is people are putting heat lamps under fairly young calves <clears throat> to give them the option of going in under it if they're feeling a bit on the cold side. And that will allow them to warm themselves up uh, in, in a localised point. And, and again, we're only talking about needing it for a couple of weeks, those kind of uh, things. And the other thing is what people are using is they're using some of these um, uh, calf coats. Yeah. Uh, and particularly for small, vulnerable looking calves. And what they'll do is they'll um, they, they increase the temperature, I believe, by about 10 degrees. So a five degree house would be the equivalent of a 15 degree uh, house with, with a coat on, on some of those smaller calves. And they only need it for the, for the first couple of weeks to keep them warm. I go with the straw first myself because it's the cheapest option. But that's me. I'm, I'll be tight. If you look on the right-hand side, then, Stuart. Yeah, the other thing, George, actually, is canopy kind of area in the pen. Um, exactly. I see those going in. Creating a micro-environment inside it. It does. And that, that will help, absolutely help as well. I can't tell you what the degree difference is, Stuart, but it is, you see calves lying under them in cold weather, so the, it must be doing something. It is It is a... The favorite environment of them that's a fair point yeah and they have, just i suppose charging and the health and safety <laughs> we better point out that people need to be careful with the heat lamps around straw and so forth so oh, yeah so some people actually have 
um, some heat lamps that are set up to come, cut in basically when the temperature drops below. Oh, it's elaborate, obviously. But, exactly. Um, and the, the heat lamps come on in the, in the shade just to keep the in, environment warmer as well. So exactly. anything that will avoid that, basically, I, I always talk about it in the, in context of if you go to a match or a funeral, unfortunately, is the typical example because it tends to be late in the evening or whatever, um, and you're standing around and it's cold. It's very hard to keep yourself warm and the calf jacket, the way I think of it is like the, the lights of the base layers that you see. I actually see a lot of farmers wearing them now uh, more and more as well to keep their own body temperature up, we'll say, when they're out in cold weather in, in the springtime. So calf jacket is the same scenario, keeping the core warm and obviously then you're not as uh, vulnerable, I suppose. You're not burning you're... as much energy to maintain your, your exactly. core body temperature. Exactly. Yeah. Now, just on the right hand side of this graph here then, so how much powder equivalent is required maintain the calf so at 15 degrees at uh, 15 degrees celsius we talked about the 380 grams of powder but in that young calf if it's at a lower temperature say five and a half degrees it's it's requiring the equivalent of around 480 grams of powder to keep itself warm in the, those early weeks of, of uh, life so you can see that that'll reduce uh, growth rates in those calves by the equivalent of around 10 percent uh, for the same volume of feed uh, same quantity of powder being fed per calf. Per day. Very close to a liter of of replacer, if you say it, at one hundred twenty five exactly. grams a liter, like so. Just it's to... roughly under a liter of powder you're talking. Yeah. Of a replacer. Sorry, Stuart. Okay. The other question we're often asked is, and and from a Yone's perspective, it's often seen as a kind of a preferred route to move calves quickly away from either the colostrum or the the transition milk, particularly the heifer calves, and I tend to focus on those. <coughs> Excuse me. To move them quickly onto uh, uh, milk powder. So the research at, at Moore Park was carried out and it looked at three stages. We had a yellow column here and that refers to calves that were fed a quality colostrum and four feeds of transition milk. That's the second and subsequent milkings from the cow. And then onto a, a quality milk replacer okay, for until weaning time. Or the yellow column then refers to calves that got colostrum and were put straight onto a 26% or a high quality milk replacer after one feed of colostrum, one feed of quality colostrum. I suppose, Stuart, we didn't mention it, but it, it, it should come up. And it came up at the webinar the other night. How do you know a quality colostrum? You, you, get, a, you get one of those, um, what do you call them, Stuart? Bricks refractometer. A refractometer yeah. and make sure. And actually, I was out, out with a group yesterday, and uh, one of the guys in the group had uh, a refractometer, and he said it's unbelievable the variation in the quality of the colostrum the cows producing. So he reckons it's an essential tool to determining quality colostrum. Right, but all, all these calves got a quality colostrum. You got it for either once, followed by four feeds of transition milk and then a quality milk replacer, or they got one feed of colostrum and straight onto a milk replacer. And if you look at this graph here, at weaning time, at 140 days, and at 240 days, eight months later effectively, there was no difference in the performance of those calves. The only caveat I put in with that is, I had a farmer I know pretty well who had a significant urinary problem on his farm. And he followed the protocol that we laid out for him in terms of getting them quickly onto a quality milk replacer. He fed his bull calves and beef calves that were going off farm the transition milk. And he said that the performance of the beef calves was better. And the reason for that was because in his herd, he had a problem with scour in the calf house. And the scour was uh, reducing the growth rate of his replacement heifers on the quality milk replacer by feeding a transition milk in situations where there is a, a health risk to, to the calves. It protects them at the intestinal level and keeps their performance up. They were better protected than the calves that were on the milk powder, basically, is what we're saying. So it's just a, a greater availability of antibodies um, through the, the transition milk for the couple of days extra for a couple, for a couple of days extra or even a week or two extra so if someone is in that scenario George then like um, you no, know, obviously you'll have to be testing for Yonas or you probably won't know you have Yonas problem in the first place but trying to identify and store colostrum from good quality uh, clean cows would say would be the objective there then and trying to there's a bit of management in it but if you, could, is, yeah. you could gather that milk then for to feed a couple of extra transition feeds that you knew was clean that would exactly. help alleviate against the owners, but also keep you in, in a good situation in terms of calf health then as well. Right. And ear, earmark, literally earmark cows that are dubious for owners. What, what we farmers doing at this stage, Stuart, is 
just put an extra tag in the rear, put a red tag in the rear. Yeah. Just a blank red tag, just to remind you that these cows are suspect. Yeah. And control control what happens in the lemmings. When when you have a visual when we have a visual a visual uh, cue with cows like that, it makes such a difference in terms of reminding people of the, the risks that they run. Yeah. So this one of the last slides I have, Stuart, is a broad guideline. So it's this isn't a, this isn't the definitive answer for it, but it's a kind of people often ask you about um, how do we get our calves from twice a day feeding to once a day feeding kind of in a kind of a relatively safe way. And and one of the kind of broad guidelines, kind of rough guidelines for how it might how it might uh, pan out in, in reality is we'll, we'll talk about a scenario where we have a calf that's gone its 28 days of age. Uh, it's on six litres of, of uh, uh, milk replacer with 750 grams of, of milk replacer being fed in those six litres in two feeds a day. So the day before you start, put your calf on, uh, keep your calf on, it's, it's, on its two, it's on its two feeds in the day. On the day you start, you skip the evening feed. You give them the morning feed, three litres with 275 grams of powder in it. Then on day one of the new regime, it gets three and a half litres of feed, and that'll contain 550 grams. And slowly step up the powder over a couple of days by 50 grams a calf a day. And you can get to, you'll probably get to close to 700 grams of powder by about day four. You might never get to it, Stuart. In some cases, the calves just won't drink it. Because you'll, what you'll find immediately when they go this route, Stuart, is you'll find that they um, start eating start or start more. eating a lot of meal. It, it makes them quite full very quickly. Yeah. But you should, you'll, you'll get, we're talking about calves a month of age and more, and you should be able to step them up to around a 20% solution over four or five days. So it's important there, George, I suppose, as well, um, just if you jump back there one slide yeah. again, that um, people see that that's, it's, you're not going, trying to get to 700 straight in on day one, like. Highly, highly risky. Yeah. Highly risky. The reason being, you, you, you're changing the consistency of the feed now, or the, the what they call it, osmolality, they call it, yes. which is a fancy name for how thick it is. And you don't want to do things that, that uh, quickly or that rapidly or drastically alter the, passage of the liquid through the through the abomase yeah, yeah. so so from the calf care webinar on tuesday night that's a key yeah. potential trigger for bloating calves that, i that think adjust, if we um, rapid adjustment of osmolarity so controlling that by by stepping it up like you've described there is exactly. is the way it's, it's, it's like a gentle way of doing it it's a bit like cows going to grass basically off the silage cold turkey not not that you could end up with issues with them whereas when they calve giving them the four days inside they settle down a small bit then they can go to grass maybe that might still be getting a bit of silage for a few days um exactly. especially yeah. around frosty weather and so forth with frosty grass and just transitioning everything is is it's important that people don't just go bang like exactly exactly and was finally short if you want to read a bit more about some of the technical notes around calf micro places and the spec that they should have there's a document there on the Animal Health Ireland website developed by the Technical Working Group on Calf Care that's worth having a look at uh, for people who want to pursue uh, some of the information a bit further. Yeah, and I suppose the key thing about that, George, is it's independent, would say, because obviously every company is going to be trying to push their angle on people. So trying to trying to do your own research on it in the background, yeah. this is a, an independent document. Like it's so. developed by a panel of technical experts. Which, which will actually include some of the companies that are selling products. Which does include the companies, yeah. and, and, and so it should. But it's, it's a balanced, uh, it's a balanced um, uh, reference document. Yeah. So, George, I think this question actually came up as well the other night, maybe, but um, uh, I will throw it at you again. And I know one of the other advisors was asking us about it there in terms of topping up, maybe. But Lawrence Sexton is just wondering, is there any advantage feeding whole milk with powders? Yeah, no problem at all. Um, we're talking now, uh, Lawrence, about the, the conventional 12.5% um, solution and mixing whole milk through it does, does confer additive protection in the situation, particularly in situations where there's a bit of a disease thought around the place. Absolutely. But putting a transition milk, milk through with whole milk, or with a milk, milk replacer shouldn't present any problems at all. Okay. And George, this was uh, something that we probably need to focus on because... Uh, with the best will in the world, we might start off well, but weighing out that powder and maybe even Liam Gannon was saying the other night, and it's, I've often heard it, is, is the change of batches maybe as well. So you could have two pellets that you've gotten now and um, even the two pellets that you have maybe out of a different batch potentially. So just 
when you do switch checking the weights now realistically it's probably not feasible for people to be weighing out every lot of powder so no. you need to get a, a constant get a jug or a measure that you can use yeah that's fairly constant but i say checking now and again checking regularly is is a good idea because you, you know yourself Stuart. there's a little bit of drift goes on in places uh, in terms of the quantities that are fed on a day-to-day -day basis so if you're checking once a week to kind of recalibrate your eyes wouldn't be any harm yeah, and uh, we use a product at home, George, last year, um, and we just actually put, I just put a, an A4 page up in the parlour in the dairy to show what the mixing rates were for the various yeah. numbers of calves, and it, it was just made it so much easier because you're often doing this calculation in your head about the That's number right. of calves in the pen. So there's two things I suppose people should be doing in terms of calf feeding is, the like your hair said the other night, um, is calculating the space that they're going to be standing in and making sure that you don't overload that. And yeah. then you can do, you could write it up, write that up in the wall. And the other thing that you could write up in the wall then is the, either the volume of milk to, to, to get or the weight, the amount of powder or how many jugs I think uh, is probably the easiest way maybe or how many measures or whatever. Yeah. And that works well in general. So I suppose to sum it up, George, if people have been on powder all along, there's no real reason just because of the chain, the, the hike in price, um, no. a, bit, a bit like fertilizer, you, you can kind of st you still need to use it or you can yeah. still continue to use it. Um, and I suppose the, the quality of it is important. Um, like, like anything in reality, you're going to get what you pay for. Uh, so the dearer milk replacer, while it is dearer, it, it's dearer for a reason. And it's because it's got a better ingredient profile and, and maybe Generally. better base constituents as well. So not, like, like Rand Seal, it, it does exactly as it says on the tin is kind of what you're looking for, isn't it? Generally speaking, sure, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so I think uh, people are quiet there. Obviously, you, you covered all the bases, George, as, as always. So no, only the one question there from Lauren. So um, thanks for coming on this morning. And uh, we wish everyone well for the week. And we'll be back again next week. Um, and we'll talk to you then. So thanks very much, George. That's all for this week's Let's Talk Dairy webinar series. And don't forget to look out for more bonus episodes each week. I'll be back with our usual Dairy Edge interview on Monday. So do listen in then. I'm Emma-Louise Coffey and thanks for listening.